1500, so I will start now. Sure. So, it's 1500. It's time for the next talk by Merlin and Bart. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk because uh, it's not, as I perceive the project, not only about uh, regaining control over your smartphones, which is of course very good, but it's also to be able to keep your phones longer even if there's no further support from vendors anymore. That's what else I also like. But let's get more first-hand facts from Merlin and Bart. Enjoy. Thank you all. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm Merlin or Merlin. This is Bart. I'm going to briefly tell you what we're going to be talking about. Then we'll introduce ourselves and we'll roll right into the contents. Um, so this is better. So our talk is titled Status of New Linux on the Smartphone, How to uh, Liberate Your Device by Running Actual Linux and Software You Control. So we're going to briefly introduce ourselves first. Then I will talk about why why we need the Linux on the smartphone. Like, why do we need it? Uh, I think the answer is obvious, but maybe it isn't, so we're going to discuss that for a while. Then I'll talk about some hard and hardware problems and potential solutions to that. Uh, then Bart will give you an overview of all the existing software out there, like all the different efforts that people are undertaking. Uh, he'll talk about PostMarker OS, and I'll, take a, I'll talk about uh, MIMO. And uh, by that time, we should get to questions. Uh, so my name is Merlin, or Merlijn in Dutch. I studied at the University of Amsterdam. I did computer science. Um, I do work for the Internet Archive. Archive work, they did the Wayback Machine, the archive web pages and books and CDs and other cool stuff. And in my spare time at night, I work on uh, Mimo Lesse. I am also a board member of the Amsterdam Hackerspace, have been for a while, and I uh, run Tor exits and, and work on other free software projects. So. Uh my name is Bart Rivers. Um, I'm mostly known as Pure Out on the internet. Uh, I work on PostMark OS and also because of PostMark OS, I also work on Alpine Linux. Um, I'm still studying. I'm, I live in the Netherlands. Um, and my school sadly is a bit dominated by the proprietary Windows account, so I'm the only one that's trying to uh, liberate the school. Um, and yeah, basically that's it. Okay, so. Why should you run Linux on your smartphone? Uh, there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, first of all, um, you, you know, thank you. <laughs> um, so, I, how many of you are running iOS or Android? Just raise your hands. iOS or Android? How many of you are running Android? <laughs> Most of you are running Android, right? So, Android runs Linux of some kind. Um, but it's not really GNU Linux. How, much of you, how many of you are running Linux US? It's like 5% of the people that just raised their hands. So most of you use Android that was installed by your vendor, which could be Motorola or Google or some other hardware vendor. And if you look at what we do on our laptops, like how many people of you are running Linux on your laptop? Right? Did you install it yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but we, we do this on our servers, we do this on our desktops, we do this on our laptops, but we don't do it on our phones. And there are many reasons for that. Um, and we'll, we'll get to some of those reasons, but first, why would you want that? So obviously, if you run your software on your phone, uh, <laughs> on your laptop, you have full control. You, you, are the, you are the admin, you decide what runs, you decide what distro you want, you decide if you want GNOME or KDE or Wayland or Xorg or Sway or whatever you want to run. And I think that's very important. I think that's what draws a lot of different crowds and, and you know, binds us together in the fact that we can work on all these different things. Um, and it gives you the, and we have the freedom to modify whatever we want. So we can change the software, we can uh, uh, fix stuff, we can work as a community to make all of this better. And with the smartphones, we really can't. With Apple, it's just they work on something and that's it. Maybe you can report a bug and you'll hear something in a couple months. Google does some, some of the code is open source, but they work in a closed way, so every now and then they just drop code, and, and that's kind of it. Um, so there's no way that we as a community here can, can work together currently. Uh, there's some efforts to do that, but they're not super well known. Um, yeah. 
And of course, if you, if you have an Android phone right now, uh, you're dependent on your manufacturer. If Motorola supports Android until 6.0, then if you, Android 7.0 is released or there are security fixes, you have to wait for them to fix it. Or flash Linux OS if it supports your device. Um, and there's no support, and they usually they make you get a new device every couple years, which is not ideal. Because, you know, I'm, I'm still using my Nokia N100 and have been for the last 10 years, and it still works fine. And very often, Android has basically iOS as well. They have spyware built into some point. That, at the point that you know, like, if you have your phone, uh, you know it's tracking you in some way. And you have to figure out all these different ways it tracks you. You have to deny permissions for everything. It gets very tricky. And I think the right way to do it is to start with a device that doesn't track you at all in any way, and then start reasoning about how, how you can make it not track you. Uh, very often, there's a lot of bloatware, super large apps and lock-ins of different communication platforms, and I think that's not, not a good thing for the community as well. OK, so what does it mean? If we want to be in control and we don't want to be dependent on a manufacturer, what do we need? So I think the essential pieces of a Linux smartphone is that it has mainline Linux support. And for those of you who don't know, mainline Linux means that you can go to kernel.org, the website of Linux, you download the latest release, and you can build it for your device, and it works, more or less. There might be some driver issues, but it just works. And for most of your Android devices, you can't do that. It won't be supported in Linux because the vendor just made some changes, and maybe if you're lucky, you can get the changes, as the last talk covered. Um, and that's kind of it. So if, you, if we all want to work together on Linux, we need this to, to be there. And we don't, we want most of the drivers to be open source so that we can improve the drivers, make them better. And we need a bootloader without restrictions. So if you run uh, uh, various Android bootloaders or something else, as long as they allow you to boot Linux, your own version of Linux, so it doesn't have, it's not signed by some cryptographic key and you can just do it yourself, that's probably good enough. It would be ideal if the bootloader is completely open source from the start, um, but that might not be uh, completely realistic. And of course, if you have Linux and a bootloader, you need something other than the kernel to actually do stuff with your phone. So we need usable user space that's free and open source. And ideally, there would be many distros and many UIs like we have right now on our laptops. Um, but there's quite some problems. So uh, if you boot your laptop with Intel, you just kind of insert the, whatever your distro is. Maybe you want to uh, CD or USB stick, and it, boots to a bootloader, and it just boots to a desktop or a UI, and you can do things. On a phone, this doesn't work that way. Um, hardware support on ARM is different. There's no BIOS that sets everything up and then loads a bootloader, and then the bootloader will go to Linux, and Linux lo looks at whatever the BIOS provides, provides it on, on whatever's on the PCI bus to load the drivers. This is not there on ARM. There's no currently uh, very good infrastructure to do that. There's some, there's some progress has been made, but for a lot of uh, devices, that doesn't work. Um, so that's harder. You, you have to often compile your own kernel with the right options. Uh, so you can't just plug in something and hope, hope it works. And of course, most of the devices, as I said, have vendor-only only kernels. So they take, take Linux from a certain point, they add some things, and that's, that's kind of it. They never contribute it back. Uh, the bootloader sometimes is even locked down, and specifically bootloaders here, you have to configure them manually, often compile them as well, because they have the same problem. They don't know what hardware is in your device, and they can't detect. What, what they should support to even render something on your screen. And there's so many devices. <laughs> there's so many different Android phones, and there's so many different Chinese ones, and, and different uh, large uh, United States manufacturers. And another problem is power management. Power management on the desktop and laptop is pretty good with Linux nowadays. Like some, if you're lucky, you can get eight or nine hours in your laptop. If your phone lasts only eight or nine, nine hours in your pocket and it gets warm, it's not a very good. Like, you need, we need something better. And with the 64-bit uh, ARM, some of what I said before got a little better, so there's some way to detect um, what drivers you have. If you have a, a, a EFI bootloader, then you can kind of do it, but it's still somewhat problematic. So these are a lot of problems. There's some solutions that we as a community can, or some things we can do as a community to hopefully uh, make this a little less painful. We can focus only on only a couple of devices, so take couple of Android phones or whatever phones people make that are not that hard to support or are GPL friendly, have GPL friendly manufacturers, that kind of stuff will be good. 
or if people are manufacturing new devices, they should pick a system on chip that is well supported by Linux already. So system on chip is basically the computer and graphics card and most of the things integrated in a simple small thing that is on your phone. And there's actually a company doing that or several companies doing that. We'll cover them in a bit. And I think the way to actually get Linux support proper is not to rely on Android and an Android kernel by a vendor to provide some drivers and then rely on it. So there's, there's some good uh, projects that uh, add abstraction layers around Android and Android drivers so you can run your own Linux stuff on there. But it doesn't get us any closer to actual mainline Linux on our phones. So there are two companies working on new devices right now. The first one is Pine64. Um, they have a stand in the AW building today. I think they might have a stand until 5, so after the talk finishes, you can still go there. Um, and they are showing off uh, their uh, phone and tablet with various OSs that currently are in alpha state or kind of working right now. So if you're excited, you should go there. And specifically, they are working on something called the Pine Phone. Maybe not surprising. Um, it uh, features an all winner A64 SOC, system on chip, and it has very good mainline support. And this is not necessarily because of the company all winner, but because for the last couple of years, people uh, who visit FOSDAM have been working very actively to support the devices because you can find them in a lot of single board computers. Um, so if you know Raspberry Pi, there's a lot of other boards like that, like there's Olimax boards and Pi64, they make boards with all winner chips in there, and you can use them as a small server at home or as a, a, a media box. So uh, mainline support in Linux is, is really good. The driver support is getting uh, pretty decent. There's two, gig, two gigabyte of RAM, eMMC, and a quad-core CPU. And there's an open source 3D driver. Um, for many years, specifically 3D in the whole ARM space has been a big problem. And I, don't, I think four or five years ago, someone here, uh, uh, LibV, started working on the uh, Lima driver for the Mali 400 GPU. He did a lot of work. He did a, a big talk here on the K building a couple of years ago and then stopped working on it and then others picked it up. And now today we actually have a driver that works on way on the next org. So that's awesome. And another cool thing that the Pine Phone features are kill switches. So if you want to only turn off your microphone, you just flip a physical switch and then the line of your microphone no longer runs to your phone. So there's no way that whatever you say will be recorded by the modem. Uh, you can do the same for Wi-Fi, you can turn up your cameras, you can do the same for Bluetooth. So that's, that's kind of neat if you want like, some extra privacy features. It features a worldwide 4G slash LTE modem, so wherever you go, it should just work. And they will likely, when the phone is finished, allow you to pick a distribution that kind of works on the phone, and then they'll pre-install it for you. So that's kind of cool. I'll uh, let Bart continue. Uh, and it costs about 150 euros, <laughs> approximately. Uh, the, o so, the other company is Purism, is making the Librem 5. It might be more known to the community. Um, the device is actually based on a different sock than the Pinephone is. Um, it's a bit more powerful as well. The, the kill switches are actually on the outside, while on the Pinephone they're on the inside of the phone. So it's a bit hard. A bit easier actually to um, flip the switch. Um, the mainline support is also well, pretty good. The, it still runs on some out of three patches, but they're actively being worked on and being upstreamed. Um, from Purism, they're working on uh, the distribution PureOS, which is the main focus for the Librem 5. It's probably going to run that out of the box. Um, and at the moment, they have the Chestnut edition shipped. That just means it's one of the first batches that has shipped. Um, they work in several batches, meaning the first batch has um, it's basically an early version, and there might be some little issues with it, and the next batch has those issues fixed, and then some issues might occur there, and the next, issue, next batch has those issues fixed. Um, Chestnut edition is basically for the, the, um, the brave heart, the people that don't really mind having some issues and uh, don't mind working around them. I think right now the price is $800, but it's changing a bit, so it might not be accurate. Um, and depending on the region you're at, uh, it uses a different modem. Um, I think especially USA versus um, Europe and Indian. Um, 
But it's basically just a problem in a Pine phone, and hopefully we'll see uh, a lot of people next year using it instead of their Android phones. Um, so to give an overview of the currently um, various efforts to put Linux on mobile, there are a lot of distros out there at the moment. Um, just to start somewhere, we have KD Neon. It's made by the KD project. It's already used on desktop a lot. Um, it's just basically based on GNOME, or uh, sorry, Ubuntu, with the newest KDE stack on it. Um, in case of mobile, they put uh, the newest versions of all the mobile components of KDE on it. Um, to make it work on current phones, just not the Pine phone and the, the Librem 5, but on regular Android phones, they use LibHybris, which is a, a technique to make Android drivers and stuff work on regular Linux systems. Um, and it's basically the main, uh, the main development distribution for KDE on mobile. Uh, the next one will be Ubuntu Touch. This is probably the most uh, completed distribution at the moment out there. Um, it works a bit differently than most distributions. The base system is uh, read-only, and they install packages with, uh, they call it the click system. Um, and if they update the system, it just reboots into the recovery modus, installs the new version, then reboots into it, instead of running, uh, say, apt get update. It comes with Unity 8. Uh, on most devices at the moment, it uses, uh, again, libhybris to work, to make the drivers work. Um, but they're quite far advanced as well with the Pinephone and Librem 5 to make it work with mainline drivers and without libhybris. Um, and if you want to run uh, a Linux on mobile system like this year, and you want some apps to run, Ubuntu Touch is probably your best bet. <coughs> then we have Nemo Mobile, uh, based on the, originally on Mer, nowadays that's basically Sailfish OS. Um, it basically takes Sailfish OS but replaces the proprietary components of it with uh, free and open source software that mainly comes down to the, the user interface and the applications that come with it. Um, it basically runs on every device that Sailfish OS runs on it, just replace the, the, or put a repository of them on top of it, install the different packages, and it will run. Um, then we have LunaOS. It's based on the older WebOS, which was made by LG. They originally discontinued the effort to make WebOS, and then the community decided to fork it and make LunaOS. Nowadays, LG has picked up WebOS again. Um, so LunaOS is nowadays working with LG to bring the, all the components back together, um, make sure that it stays open source and uh, it's based on modern techniques and hardware. Again, it uses libhybris to work uh, instead of mainline drivers, but they're working on the Pine phone as well, in which case, again, they'll use the mainline drivers properly. Then we have Asteroid OS. It's a bit different. It's not really a smartphone OS, but more a smartwatch OS. Um, it's again uses libhybris. It's made for the uh, smartwatches, which basically at the moment run Android Watch. Um, it's a regular Linux system. I think it's based on Yocto or Open Embedded. I'm not entirely sure. Um, the, the UI and stuff is again based on Mare, um, but just updated in a different direction. Then AOSC, uh, it's made for more of the, uh, the Eastern Asian market. Its uh, main focus is on Plasma Mobile, runs on mainline only. It doesn't run on any other devices that do not have mainline. So it's basically, at the moment, mainly the Pine Phone and Libre 5. Uh, then we have PureOS. This is made by Purism, the company that makes the Librem 5. It's mainly focused on running on the Librem 5, although also on the other Librem products, so the laptops. Um, this Pure OS will ship with Posh. I'm not sure how to pronounce it properly, but it's based on the GNOME stack. Um, they use GNOME technologies and they uh, run GNOME applications, but adapted so they uh, res are made responsive and will resize them to various phone sizes. This Pure OS is made to only run a mainline uh, kernels, because only made to run on Librem 5, really. But in theory, it can run on any phone that has mainline. And it's a fork of Debian. Then we have Manjaro. They popped up recently, um, showing they had interest in making a mobile version as well. It's Manjaro ARM project. Um, they focus at the moment on Plasma Mobile, but they're based on Arch, so in theory they can run anything that Arch can run. Um, and also it's uh, made to run only on mainline kernels, and at the moment they're working on mainly the Pinephone. 
And then we have NixOS. Uh, last year they got funding by NLNet to work on it, so they now have a full-time developer. It's a standalone OS. Um, it works a bit differently. The package manager is quite interesting. I can recommend you look into it. Um, it runs on uh, the Pinephone as well, but they're also trying to get it on run on uh, existing Android devices, in which case, again, it uses LibHybris. The desk or the interface it will come with is not set in stone yet. We're working on multiple interfaces. So you can probably eventually run Plus Mobile in it, and Forge, and Unity, and hopefully lots of others. So post market OS, that's what I work on. In my opinion, the best one, but probably will others disagree. <laughs> um, this was announced on the 26th of May 2017 by uh, Oliver Smith. Uh, he had worked on it in private for a year by then. He made some basic tooling to work on it, and uh, at that point he thought it was ready to show it to the world. Um, when he made the original blog post that announced the project, it only supported two devices, or at least booted on two devices. But basically now we boot up to 173 devices. It sounds like a lot, but it's probably not even half of all the Android phones out there. It's quite a lot. Um, do note, we say support, but it doesn't mean you can pick up the phone, install Postmark OS on it, and expect to make a call and have fun with it. It's more, most devices are more in like a Raspberry Pi stage. You have a working Wi-Fi, you have a working screen, and you can run some interesting applications in it. Um, but don't expect that you can make calls or send SMS with it. We do have a few devices that um, what you can make calls with, or at least close to make calls with, but most of them will not be the case. Um, well, Postmark is based on Alpine Linux. It's um, probably mostly popular distro for uh, Docker containers and on server installations, but it will also work fine on, uh, on laptops, desktops, and in our case, phones. We chose Alpine Linux uh, mainly because it's really tiny. The base installation, without the kernel that is, is only six megabytes big. So that's uh, basically a booting system once you add the kernel. And um, because we work, we, we chose this because of the size, because we work with a lot of change routes. We, every time we do something, we make a change route, do some stuff in it, we remove the change route. And, um, that happens a lot, and if you do that like six times a day, you don't really want to wait every time the whole distribution is installed. Because our system is only, only the basis anyway, it's only six megabytes big, this isn't an issue. Um, the change routes are made and, dis are made and removed again in theory within seconds, and um, the development is quick because of it. We're basically a, of a repository on top of LP Linux, so we use all the packages from LP Linux. And although we have our own custom stuff sometimes, we do try to upstream as much as possible to Alpine Linux and um, where possible also custom patches to the various projects that are out there. Uh, we are like NixOS basically, um, we are interface agnostic, meaning we currently focusing on Plasma Mobile, but we also ship Fosh. We had Unity in the past, Unity 8, and we'll ship, hopefully ship it again in the future. But we also um, ship with Hilden from Memo Leste, and hopefully in the future also Glacier UI and any other UI that might pop up. So we try to give the choice to the user. You can use our system, but it doesn't mean you have, you have to be forced to one uh, interface or another. Um, like I said before, don't expect most devices to install it on uh, the system on and then expect it to call. We are basically in alpha state. You can boot the system, you can have a mess around with it, have fun, and except for a few devices, you probably won't use it as a phone in our case. But the Raspberry Pi is also cool, basically, so you can use it like that. Um, we, are, uh, we have our chat channels on Matrix and RC. Please join when you feel free. Um, we, we need both end users and developers. We can use all the help. I um, hope to see you there. Back to Marlijn. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah, I think so. OK. <laughs> Definitely works, right? OK. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about what I've been working on, uh, which is uh, Memo Lesta. I hope I pronounce it correctly. I'm not from Finland, and I've heard people pronounce it differently. Memo, Memo. Uh, I say Memo. Hope it doesn't offend anyone. Um, it was developed by Nokia a long time ago. Nokia was in the smartphone business, uh, an internet tablet business, maybe even before Apple made their first iPhone. Maybe it was around the same time. And they have been working on Memo for a while. 
They had various internet tablets. They had the N770, the N800, the N810. Those were all internet tablets. You can use them for navigation, but they had no uh, cellular modem in there. And then they made the uh, N900 that I still use today. Um, and they had a lot of people working on that OS, and it was based on Debian. And by that, I don't mean that they literally used the Debian repository, but they used uh, uh, APT, the package manager, the, uh, the Deb package format, and a lot of the base system was the same. Um, they actually sold a lot of devices. They sold, I think, well, a lot. At least, I think it's a lot. They sold a couple hundred thousand Nokia 900s at least. So a lot of uh, people who don't typically visit FOSDAM actually use that device probably for a couple years. And um, it's still being maintained by the community. There were actually a lot of people using it. It was kind of dubbed the hacker phone because Nokia 900 had a radio transmitter and receiver in there. So you could put it in your car and it will transmit radio on your car radio and you can just listen to that and a lot of, a lot of cool features. Um, and the community maintained it for a long time, but now there's not a, lot of, not, a, not a lot of maintenance anymore. But the cool thing is that they still have a lot of packages on uh, memo.org with maps, calculators, useful stuff. Okay, and I've been using it ever since, as I said, and the big problem is that not everything in MAMO 5, which is the MAMO they made for the Nokia 900, is open source. Uh, if it was, it would, I'm, I think it would have uh, uh, kept on living for a long time, uh, ever since they made it and not you know, be in a hiatus state for a while. Um, and big parts are not open source, so that's a problem. So I've covered some of it. Um, like, wh why are we doing this? Um, I, I love the OS and I still want to be able to use it. That's a personal reason for me and uh, this phone, the N100 is becoming very old so I need a new device on which I can run the same or similar software which actually gives me GNU slash Linux on my phone. And I just want it to be fully open source because this one is not. Um, so, and, and it's been used by a lot of ordinary users. The UI might look a little arcane at this point. I'll show you a screenshot later. I think it's actually very usable still, um, but it doesn't look anything like iOS and Android now look, look like. Um, and Memo Last is entirely commu community developed. So over the years, a lot of community members have worked and they've come and gone and there's currently three or four people actively working on Memo Last and we started about two years ago. And there's a lot more people joining and testing and, and fixing minor things, but there's like three or four core developers. So it's not that many. Um, and I really like the fact that we're community developed because there's no corporate backing and there's no special interest. Nobody wants to run their specific cloud on our device or we're not pre-installing any specific cloud software or whatever. And there's no specific direction that we'll take it just because the company wants it or thinks it makes sense financially. Um, and it's compatible with this existing software. So as opposed to, I think, every single mobile distro you named, uh, they all run Wayland, right? And we are the only one that still uses X11. You can hate it or like it. Uh, <laughs> the code works on X11. It was open source. There was no reason for us to make that work on Wayland right now. And it uses uh, GTK 2, 3, and QD. And there are some patches to GTK, but it's mostly theming and some, and some widgets. But it also means that if you want to run let's say something crazy LibreOffice, you can just install it and it will actually just start in the device. It probably won't be very usable because there's all these buttons and menus, but it will look stylishly, the dialogues will be styled and they kind of integrate in the system. If you take more simple applications, they'll probably just run. Um, and I, I think that's a big feat because if you, were, if you base your work on top of Debian and, 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 and Dev1 as I'll, I'll uh, talk about in a bit, then there's 20,000 packages in the repository that you can all just install and use. And some of them might be a bit clunky, but they might also be very good. And everything that we do is open source. Everything that we write now is GPL. And if there's some open source license that was not GPL before, then we just run with it. Uh, if Nokia wrote something that was not, uh, uh, not GPL. Another thing that I really like is that the APIs for MAMO are developed with mobile in mind. So they thought about power management. They think about things like there's a proximity sensor. So if you put something to your ear, the screen needs to go off and the touch screen shouldn't work anymore, right? Because otherwise you're pressing buttons. Or if you're in a darker room, then the brightness should adjust itself to the ambient level. Um, there's a compass in there. If you flip the phone, it needs to go to portrait or landscape mode, that kind of stuff. And all the APIs are there. So if we're working on making all this work, we have a, a, a fixed point. We just 
follow what the APIs did, we re-implement them, and it all kind of just works. It uses only, uh, on the N100, it actually uses like 80 megabytes. 150 megabytes is the, the, the default, I think, on 64-bit on, on uh, devices. And there's a lot of applications out there that were community developed, and if we keep the same APIs mostly, then it's just a matter of recompiling them, and they work. So that's, I think that's really cool. And it allows us to keep focus. So what do we do? We uh, ported code and we updated APIs. We looked at some code uh, 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 programs that were not open source, and we tried to figure out how they worked and re-implemented them. If they were a demo, we just looked at the interfaces, and we tried to just make that work. Um, and we build everything in Jenkins. So we have, we have Git repositories currently on GitHub, and Jenkins just builds whatever we committed, builds it for us, and adds it back to the Debian repository. And installing Memo is a simple, if you, if you want to do it, you can just install Debian or Dev1 because we don't use systemd, but someone is working on systemd support if you really want it. <laughs> um, but you just add a single line and you install our meta packets and that's it. It just works on top of Debian. I think that's, I think that's really cool. And our aim is to make it work for people here at FOSDEM, at, 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 for hackers, for open source enthusiasts, and not necessarily for the end user. We'll maybe get there, but we're not there now. And the real cool thing is that I think somewhere mid last year, we submitted for funding for Nelnet, which is a, a, a nonprofit in the Netherlands, and we actually got 40,000 uh, euros in funding. So we get to get paid for, for some of the work we do. Uh, this is what it looks like on the N900. Uh, you can see that I was testing some Python bindings, so the, the binary clock shows up there. Uh, the actual clock is not a binary clock. I was just testing a replacement clock ap uh, applet. It's connected to the uh, KPN network provider in the Netherlands on 3G. The battery is full. Uh, it's on Wi-Fi. The 4 uh, says the Wi-Fi signal is pretty strong. It's currently muted for sound, and it tells me there's, that the application manager thinks there's an update available. Uh, okay, so what do we have now? It's, the, it's alpha quality at best. Um, if, you, if you got super excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> Once it works and I can make phone calls, I'm gonna start using it as my main device. I'm gonna keep on dogfooding it and I hope others will do the same. Uh, right now it runs on the Nokia N900s, the Motorola Droid 4 and the Pine Phone. Uh, I haven't mentioned the Motorola Droid 4 before. It's made by Motorola and it's one of the last physical keyboard phones they made. So the Nokia 900 has a physical keyboard, and that one does too. And it has a pretty good chip power management-wise. And someone, I think two people have been working super actively on mainline support for years, and now it actually works really well. So the Wi-Fi works, the modem works, power management works, you can get a couple days of power on that thing, so I think that's really cool. Um, and we use virtual machines for development, so you can run QMU, VMware, VirtualBox, and you can just have the desktop environment in your virtual machine, log in over SSH, and, and do your development. Um, we still need to get some core components in place. The main thing lacking, I think, right now is a phone UI, because we are actually able to make some phone calls using the command line, but that's not how you want to answer a phone or, or, or make a phone call, right? Um, I think it will probably be a couple months, honestly, to, until we get to that point. Um, but I'm still pretty excited. And as I said before, there are demo devices and, 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 uh, at the Pine64 set in AW, and I think they'll be there until 5, so maybe you've already seen them. And I'm, I'm really hoping that the power menu will be really good, because the Nokia 900 lasts for maybe a week, a week and a half, if I don't use it that much. Like, I don't, I've never seen that on an Android phone. Um, so these are the devices we support, and there's a link up there with more devices that are not that well supported, but they kind of work. Like I said, we really try to focus on a couple. And last but not least, if you're really interested in Power VR, which is the 3D driver on the Nokia 900 and the Motor Motorola Droid 4, the state was terrible, and we've been working on it with other people for a year and a half, and now you can patch mainline Linux a little bit, and it will start. The user space is still closed source, but Texas Instruments is actually building new binaries for us. Um, so it's actually looking pretty good. I'll leave it to Bart. As a, con as a conclusion, um, well, as we, we showed, there are various UIs, various distributions available. Basically, everybody, uh, everybody's choice is available and possible. Um, but all of them do need work. We need a lot of help. We, um, we, nowadays, we do have devices to run them on, so please get a device, get into the, the various chat channels, ask what you can do. We don't just need developers, we also need end users, we need people to write documentation, and um, with somewhere everybody can do that. Um, 
hopefully this year, probably first half of the year, maybe second half of the year, uh, expect phones to actually show up. The Pine phone will work, the Libra 5 will by then work, uh, and hopefully next year most people here will be able to run such a device and be able to call with it, uh, have fun with it. Um, just make sure, don't be, don't be afraid to ask questions. We're all great people. We always uh, appreciate every help we can get, all the help we can get. And um, we hope to see you in the various channels and forums and all the places we, uh, we are. Uh, hope to welcome you into our community. Uh, lastly, yeah, resources, uh, quick links. Um, Memo Leste is available on Freenode on RUC with the hashtag Memo Leste. Uh, Postmarked is available also on Freenode uh, with hashtag Postmarked OS. We're also on Matrix, the channels are bridge, so it doesn't matter which you choose. Um, please join, have a look at our websites for more information, and um, hope to see you next year. And if you're interested in more technical details for Memo specifically, I did a talk a couple months ago in Bulgaria on OpenFest, which is another great uh, open source uh, event like this. And it's about an hour long. Uh, the link is here. I'll make sure that the slides are on the FOSDEM website somehow. Uh, and it, it's more technical uh, and in-depth than this talk. It's up there. Any questions? I think that's all my fault. It is well here last the first time. With so many distributions being available, um, is there some plan to have some, to have something like flag packs? Can everyone please leave quietly or shuffle quietly because I can't hear? Please repeat. With so many distributions available, Thank you. Um, is it possible that you can run, say, I don't know, flat pack or snap on it to um, develop an, an package for one of the distributions of, for all of them? Or do you have to basically build an APK for Alpine, a Deb for Debian based ones? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the question is if uh, with so many distributions available, do you want to uh, package the app for all the different di distributions or can you use Snap or Flatback? I guess? Yeah. Um, it depends a bit on the distribution. Um, most distributions of that I mentioned do support something like Flatback or Snap. Uh, you can package them in FlatHub and it will, you can install and run them under your device. Uh, not all distribution might necessarily support out of the box, but often it's just uh, apt get install flatback and it'll work. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I didn't hear anything about Hallium. Are you working together with the Hallium guys to get? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Are you working somehow together with the Hallium guys to get? Do you know? I could not hear what you were saying. Please repeat. You didn't hear anything? OK. Um, so yeah, are you working together with the Hallium guys to get the stack for Android mobile phones? Yes, no. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you working together with the Hallium guys? To Hallium guys? OK, so the question is, are we working together with Hallium? I think Hallium is using uh, Android as a base, and it's like an abstraction around Halli uh, uh, Android to make things work better on Android devices. Um, I think a lot of distros are, but MIMO is not, because we really want to focus on mainline only, and I don't want Android modem abstractions or graphics driver abstractions or anything else like that. Maybe I, people in the community have done it. They've used it to make MIMO less to work on Android phones. Uh, we might support that in the future, but right now we, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, in case of Postmark to us, um, we have, I think, three or four devices actually losing, using Helium slash Tape Hybris. Um, most of them don't, but we definitely appreciate the effort if somebody ports Helium and our system to it. So, yeah, we should port it. Do we have more questions? Thank you. Uh, is it true that uh, for the choice of the hardware for uh, not Pine, for the other one for Prism, you only can choose the battery from the uh, Prime Prism uh, vendor, so you're locked in with that? The battery. 
changing the battery. Sorry? If you want to change the battery, you want the battery uh, gets dam so damaged and you want okay. to change it. Yeah. So, so you, are, you are locked in with a, with a prism. Yeah. You can't buy a third window. So, so that depends a bit on the device. You said, you yeah. said uh, about changing batteries, right? You have to talk about changing batteries. Yeah, so that depends on the device. On the N100, you can change batteries without problem. Uh, the Pine Phone uses a standard Samsung battery, so you can just buy those stock batteries and replace the battery in your Pine Phone. I'm not sure if you can pl replace it while the device is on. You could do that with some devices too. If you power them over USB, swap out the battery, that kind of stuff, they can work. I, I can't hear you. On the Prism smartphone, you can't uh, buy from another vendor the, the battery. Yeah. You're locked in with that, okay. with the hardware. Yeah, um, the main problem with batteries is, I guess, the voltage and the size of the battery. Most phones, even though manufacturers say you should not replace the battery, you can just get any other and it will work fine. If, I, if we take the Pine phone, um, the, they basically already set from the store. They do support replacing battery. You can get, a, I think, a Galaxy J7 battery, and it will work fine in the Pine phone. In case of Librem 5, I think they use it. Uh, custom form factor, so it'll be a bit, bit hard. But the device itself is not a reason, there's no hardware limitations on the battery. It's just a form factor, and if the voltage is good, it should be fine. Uh, what's the policy for binary blobs in post market OS? <laughs> what's the policy for binary blobs in post market OS? Do you really care about them or just whatever? Uh, the question is if we, we care about binary blobs in post yes. Mark OS? Yeah. Um, we prefer not to, of course. Uh, but in some case, some binary blobs or at least firmware is needed to get the device running. Um, we do ship at least proprietary firmware. Um, when possible, but there are some efforts to replace a proprietary firmware and proprietary blocks with open source variants. We try to use that wherever possible. For okay. example, the, the Mali GPU in the Pine phone, it has binary blobs, but we try to use Mesa instead. Um, sure. That doesn't mean if, if it's actually needed to get the device running, yeah, we, sadly we have to, but we do package it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. No Any more questions? I have a question about MMLS. Uh, does it support dual boot with the original N900 firmware? Does it support what? A dual boot with the original software from N900. Um, currently, we haven't made it work with the other software that's on the uh, old N900. Like if you, uh, for example, take their binaries, you just want to run it on MMLS, right? Um, it doesn't work. I've tried it a couple times. Some simple binaries work, but other things start to go very wrong. Uh, it uses a different a uh, API. It uses uh, um, it's ARMEL, not ARM hard float, so the floating point stuff's different. That can still sometimes work. Um, I think if you try hard enough, you might be able to make it work. But we haven't tried that hard. So OK. Do we have any more questions? Thank you very much.